welcome to the first episode in the next series of CEO Conversations. During 2020, we released quite a few of these episodes, all with the CEO of air navigation service providers from around the world. To kick off 2021, we're going to extend the conversations to the CEO of Canso Associate members, and we'll be asking them to give an industry perspective on the events of last year and their hopes for 2021. Our first guest is Richard Parker. Richard is the co-founder and CEO of Altitude Angel here in the UK. As well as being our first associate member interviewed, Richard is also our first interviewee from the UAS or UAV community. Welcome, Richard. Thanks for having me. We're going to begin just with a question about the last six to 12 months of operations and how have your operations changed compared to what they might have been pre-pandemic? That's a really good question and, and thank you. So I'm certainly very proud of the way that the team at Altitude Angel has adapted to these very dramatic changes in, in global circumstances. And as a modern aviation tech company, you know, we're already what many would call cloud first. And so from a sort of day-to-day -day perspective, not much really needed to change. But like most companies, you know, we had to adapt our working practices to reflect the change in everyone's circumstances, you know, to cater for things like team meetings and homeworking and homeschooling and, and different working hours. So overall, I think it's made us definitely a much stronger company. And aside from where we work and how we communicate most of the time, nothing really has fundamentally changed. You know, we've remained very much focused on what we do best, which is driving the UTM industry forward through the development and the deployment of the technologies that we create. So, you know, dur during this very difficult year, you know, we've we've also had quite a lot of successes too. And I'm and again, very, very proud of the team um, having worked through such difficult circumstances. You know, we, we've done things like launch a nationwide UTM platform with Norwegian ANSP Avanor. We've successfully launched the Go Drone app with our colleagues at LVNL in the Netherlands. And this was really just kind of the, the first phase in uh, multi-phase deployment with, with LVNL. And, and certainly GoDrone is going to be the foundation stone of uh, another nationwide UTM deployment. And you know, most recently, we announced work with Inmarsat and developing a world first with our pop-up UTM platform. I'm really proud of that because you know that platform has the power to save lives by allowing blue light services to use drones for search and rescue operations or to fight wildfires. So. You know, we've, we've done also uh, a fair amount of work with uh, Arrow and our Arrow Drone Zone concepts, which will revolutionize the way that people access and, and utilize drones, um, particularly on an automated uh, and BV loss basis. So, you know, I would certainly say we've had a very successful 12 months, um, you know, despite very challenging circumstances. And we also managed to, uh, to welcome in uh, a brand new investor in the company, um, which you know really helps to recognize the very strong commercial traction we've still been able to gain even through very difficult times. And what, what lessons, Richard, do you think the wider industry has learned in the last 12 months? And if we can look at those lessons, both those which have derived from successes and those which have come, if you like, the hard way. Thanks for the question, Connor. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, the COVID pandemic was something which nobody could really prepare for. No one knew that that was just around the corner. So I think it's maybe a little unfair to say, you know, to phrase things in terms of um, successes and failures. You know, I'd very much prefer to think about the opportunities and the successes that, that many have still been able to demonstrate. And I think what's been really interesting is that with the quieter skies as a result of, for example, GA flights being grounded, you know, the UAV industry has kind of really been able to use that crisis as an opportunity to trial more interesting use cases for drones um, in more places, for instance. And that's not just here in the UK, but, but right around the world. But these are mostly still very patchy demos, if you like, and, and focus on closed airspace or trials that really only work for a single company. And we, we really must think bigger. You know, and, and for example, in the UK, for instance, medical supplies have been delivered to island communities off the coast of Scotland and packages have been transported to and from lighthouses and remote villages. And in short, we're seeing an increase in the incumbent ATM industry's appetite to embrace innovation and change. And of course, you could look at the pandemic and think that you know what's happening could, could promote the exact opposite, a retrenchment on, on new ideas and new things. And we, we've seen the exact opposite and, and that's great. 
So we've certainly had successes and we've collectively embraced all of those opportunities. And certainly with a vaccine on the way, um, I hope an end is in sight, or you could perhaps refer to it as, you know, maybe the beginning of a different future. But I hope the industry remains focused on pursuing opportunities to push forwards with intent and we must keep that momentum going. Okay. One of the, one of the words that came out from the previous series of interviews quite a lot was resilience. And I'd be interested to get your view on how you think the aviation industry, suppliers like yourselves and other stakeholders, how do we work together to build resilience? I think the industry is remarkably resilient and it's to be certainly hoped that we don't see another year like 2020 in, in any of our lifetimes. I think, however, we've we've been collectively exposed, if I can use that word, throughout the pandemic, particularly in the aviation sector, to really the fragility of people, you know, whether as sort of fair paying passengers or in airspace management, much of the aviation industry's revenues were paid for or dependent on people. And we build resilience here by empowering people to deliver the same or higher levels of service through even greater automation and through better technology. So, uh, you know, kind of along the same lines, to really build long-term resilience, the industry needs to move away from managing planes to opening skies, you know, acknowledging that future revenues cannot be so fundamentally dependent on people that tourism, for example, effectively ceased at the start of the pandemic, that caused a massive disruption. You know, airlines went out of business, air traffic controllers lost jobs, you know, it was carnage. Creating alternate revenue streams then, particularly ones which embrace UAV traffic and, you know, certainly embrace greater degrees of automation within the ATM system. Surely that's really the most important aspect of resilience here. You know, when the well dries up, do you dig deeper or do you look for another source of water? So I think these new revenue streams will one day supersede the current income streams that ANSPs and other entities in, in, in organizations in this industry rely upon. And we have to adapt to survive longer term. And I think the time to go after those is really now. And I think also as an industry, we're really good at you know listening and sharing ideas and long may this continue. I think this CEO series actually is a really great example of that. I think it's a brilliant idea. But I think collectively as individuals, we need to get much better at doing. You know, for example, you know, the, the use cases with LVNL, the, the work we've done with Nats, with Avinor, other ANSPs, through research programs like Future Flight and Cesar, countless commercial opportunities, you know, from the technologies that we build around, you know, our automated routing and deconfliction um, uh, technologies. And what we need is for people to think, I want to do this too, right? And in fact, most things that are worth doing started out by someone in an organization saying, you know, we should do that. We could do this better. You know, I think resilience comes from people in these organizations saying, I want to be that person. I want to bring this change to us. So there's definitely one important theme in resilience, and, and hopefully this message will be heard. I think if you're busy doing nothing or not otherwise moving forwards, you are quite literally moving backwards. You will get left behind. And that is the antithesis of resilience. Good. I think you've touched maybe on some of the answers to the next questions, but you've mentioned the word opportunities already. Again, if you take a, an industry-wide view of the whole entire aviation supply chain and air traffic industry, what do you think are the biggest risks and opportunities for the industry in the coming years? It, I see opportunity everywhere and it's easy to spot risks. And I think let's talk about some of the risks and then let's go into some of the opportunities. So I think it might be slightly controversial, but I see some ANSPs and in some instances, even regulators kind of sleepwalking, if you like, into the arms of very big technology companies. And I think that should really worry us all. For example, why don't we question why a search engine wants to manage our skies or an e-commerce platform, for instance? You know, big tech ultimately has a history of dominating new channels of distribution. That's that's how it makes its money. And that's true, whether it's social media or logistics or insurance. So as an aviation community, we really should be asking ourselves, 
how long we think it will be after the big tech companies are given dominion over drones in uncontrolled airspace, for instance, before the push is made for controlled airspace and manned aircraft. Domination really is what big tech is all about. And I think an associated and perhaps ancillary risk here is that big aerospace companies try to pivot towards UTM, but, but not because of the opportunities afforded to their customers, ANSPs, for instance, but for revenue protection. You know, many of the ANSPs watching this webinar will be amongst their biggest customers. And it's not really in their interest to lose those very lucrative sort of hardware heavy supply and maintenance contracts. And although it's true that uh, standards exist for interchange, much of an ANSP's estate is still typically very vertical. So this is very anti-competitive and hampers the ANSP in the delivery of new services and effectively robs it of its opportunities to innovate. Now we can either choose to be at the forefront of innovation or we can get left behind entirely. And there is no really in between there. So I think you know that kind of covers off some risks. And as I said, surely I may be a little bit controversial there. But opportunities, I think you can probably guess where I'm going to focus on. You know, we know, for instance, that the predominant methods of management, uh, managing air traffic aren't particularly scalable. So ANSPs need to be bold and they need to begin to automate and streamline their operations over a timeline, which means introducing UTM services for a new generation of customers and then begin integrating this classification of traffic into everyday operations. So one thing that a lot of people don't typically equate with UTM is that, for example, many UTM technologies can actually be utilized to help with many traditional ATM workloads, you know, reducing costs, improving service levels, et cetera. It's pretty innovative stuff, but we actually have a lot of customers already doing that today. So I think this is a good example of an area that, you know, Altitude Angel can help. It's an area that we're pioneering. Actually, for over half a decade now, we've been working on UTM. But the thing I would love to leave here for Canzo uh, and its members is really an alternative definition of, of UTM. You know, you will probably refer to it as unmanned traffic management or unmanned systems traffic management, but we've typically always referred to it as unified traffic management. You know, our skies will soon be used by all manner of aircraft, some manned, some unmanned, some large, others small. We need to unify that airspace picture. And only by unifying it can we achieve really what we all want, which are busy, safe, secure skies, which are open to all. So I think that's a fantastic opportunity, and we certainly wouldn't want to squander it together. Very good. I can hear the, the passion coming through. So to end then, what three words? do you think best describe the ATM community today and why? I love this question and I've spent a long time thinking about it and I wished we could use phrases rather than, rather than words, but I'm going to come at this obviously in my position as CEO of a, a UTM technology company. So I, the first one, I'm going to have to put it in air quotes because it's really two words, um, but hopefully your members will forgive me. It's maximum capacity. And by that, what I mean is, you know, before COVID, Many airports in the ATM function were operating at close to maximum capacity. You know, there was no more slack in the system, really. And even communications bandwidth in many cases is becoming a problem. So when flight numbers return to pre-COVID levels and surge past, how will ATM cope? And I think automation is key to that. So taking parts of the process which can be automated out of um, a controller's hands, for instance, and giving them more capacity to do the work which cannot be automated is going to be absolutely critical. And we certainly envisage a world where hundreds of thousands of drone flights take place every day. And the only way that this can really be managed is if we adopt that automation now. And what better time to do it? A gradual adoption now, whilst commercial flight numbers remain low, will allow for a much smoother integration and time to test and an evolution, really, not a revolution for the ATM community. So I'd say maximum capacity would be word one, if you'll forgive the loose interpretation of that phrase. Um, the second word I would use is cautious. And being cautious is, of course, very, very sensible, especially in aviation. And there is, however, a very fine line between being cautious and being risk adverse. However, all too often, I think those two, uh, those who are sort of uh, seem to be pushing for change are labeled as risk takers. 
And that can be used as a reason to delay or even try to stop that change. Even sometimes if the introduction of those new technologies could result in, for example, even greater levels of safety. So I would say, you know, be cautious, but remember aviation is of course not about the total elimination of risk. It never has been, but rather about a good understanding of those risks and a healthy tolerance for them. So I think it's really important then to embrace new ideas, new concepts and approach them with open questions rather than a closed statement. For example, it's not safe enough versus how can we utilize this to offer new safer services or to cut costs and to do this in perhaps an even safer way than we do today. You know, I think I, I think I read somewhere that more people are injured every year putting on socks than they are by flying. Risk is relative that in that regard. So, you know, we have to bear that in mind. And then I think finally, I, I'll, I'll certainly pick up the pace. Pioneering, right? ATM has over many many years pioneered the way that we transport goods and the way people travel by developing new aircraft and you know systems for managing them, learning and sharing from mistakes and bringing new practices into play, all of which have made our skies super safe for those in the sky and those on the ground. But remember, aviation was for many years, you know, especially in the 50s and 60s, absolutely awe-inspiring to so many around the world. And I think it was awe-inspiring because it represented possibility and wonder, right? It was, it was magical to people. And I, I have to ask myself, I wonder when precisely that stopped. But, but I don't ever find myself wondering why it stopped. I think it stopped because collectively in aviation, we just stopped really innovating. You know, there isn't much that is new anymore. You know, we just refine things ever so, ever so carefully. Now, aviation was so pioneering when it reached out and it touched our lives in ways that the world had never seen before. And here's the, here's the key. That is precisely what the integration of drones will do if we manage to do that properly and we do it at scale. So I think we should all be reminded of that pyramid, you know, absolutely pioneering spirit upon which all of modern aviation was built. It's, it's part of Altitude Angel's mission to empower you and everyone else with the technologies to open skies to this next wave of aviation traffic and to be the gentle partner, which always pushes for that greatness together. You know, aviation connects and we should never ever forget that excellent richard thank you very much and thank you indeed for your enthusiasm and i look forward to meeting you once those skies reopen thank you thanks a lot